Our next presenter is uh, Dr. Gunn from Shasta Bible College, and he's going to talk about uh, Bethel Church and the New Apostolic Reformation, <clears throat> and that is you know, the latest incarnation of, broadly speaking, latter rain theology that we've talked about here and there uh, within the Pentecostal charismatic movement. <clears throat> And he lives in Shasta, where that church is located. And so he has had an opportunity to uh, uh, learn a lot about them. So, George? Amen. Yeah, okay. Right. Well, good afternoon. Hope you had, all had a good lunch. Uh, I'd like to ask you to join with me in prayer before we begin. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to meet together now this afternoon. Thank you for this conference, for the great speak speakers that we've already heard from and those that we will hear from. Bless this next session, we pray. I pray that you'll direct and guide my lips and my mind and my heart, and may this presentation be that which is profitable to us and honoring and glorifying to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, I'm George Gunn. I'm a professor at Shasta Bible College in Redding, California, and I want to talk to you today about Bethel Church and the New Apostolic Reformation. Uh, Bethel Church is located in the same city where I teach at Shasta Bible College, and so I've had the opportunity to uh, be exposed firsthand to this, uh, this doctrinal aberration that we are facing these days. I'll have to say that I, I'm not really what I uh, consider to be a, kind of a heresy headhunter. Uh, that's just not how I'm made up, but I've had to deal with the New Apostolic Reformation because of uh, where I live and teach. And so I'm, I'm um, glad for the opportunity to share some of this information with you. I'm just out of, out of curiosity, I'd like to ask just for a show, quick show of hands, how many here have heard of Bethel Church and the New Apostolic Reformation? Yeah, that's, that's more hands than I would normally see, like in just a, a church setting somewhere outside of Reading. How many have never heard before of these? Yeah, and there are some, so, <clears throat> so that's good. I think you'll, you'll hear something that will be uh, quite interesting. Um, so I have been teaching at Shasta Bible College for something like 35 years, and I have seen a lot of new things come and go. This is one of the most recent things. It's been around since about the turn of the century, around 2000. Um, but we're talking about a doctrinal aberration. And the question you might ask is, why is this even um, relevant at a prophetic conference uh, like this one? Well, I think uh, hopefully I will be able to answer that. Uh, somebody asked for a moment ago, where is that? And here is where it is. This is our campus um, over here, a picture of our campus, and we're located up at the extreme north end of California. Uh, you think of California as land of fruits and nuts. You hear that <laughs> joke a lot, and it's true. But uh, up where we live, it's kind of a rural, very conservative uh, segment of California. And, uh, and so... Uh, we love that. We're not so thrilled with uh, some of the edicts that our king, I mean Governor uh, Newsom, has been handing down recently. But uh, this is also, Redding, California, is the focal point and the center of Bethel Church and the New Apostolic Reformation. So why is this topic an important topic at the pre-trib conference? Well, the Bible cautions us that in the last days of the church age, there will be a time of apostasy and falling away. Uh, the Lord, or, or, uh, the Apostle Paul said to Timothy, realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid these men. 
And a couple of, the, a couple of items in this list that I think are particularly relevant to the New Apostolic Reformation earlier, and it talks about men who are lovers of money, and uh, the New Apostolic Reformation uh, certainly fits in with the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel movement. And then down at the end where it talks about having the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, uh, certainly I think is apropos. Some other passages that deal with the apostasy coming at the end times I have listed there for you. I'm not gonna take the time to uh, look all of them up and read them to you, but 1 Timothy 4, 2 Peter 3, and Jude verses 17 and 18. Uh, as I said, I'm not really a, um, uh, a heresy headhunter. That's not really my calling. Uh, I love to teach Bible, theology, biblical languages, uh, kind of stay positive on this, but I have had to confront New Apostolic Reformation and have looked into it in some detail. Um, I will tell you this, I'm not sure that this is a salvation issue. I think with some who are caught up in it, there is definite heresy. And I lay more blame at the feet of the leaders of the movement than the followers. I know people who attend Bethel Church and if you talk to them, they, they seem to ge have genuine love and faith in the crucified and risen Lord Jesus. But there are doctrinal aberrations that are very serious connected with this that I want to talk to you about today. So what is Bethel Church? Well, Bethel Church is just one, one local church in Reading, but it has become much more than that. And I would like to introduce you to the pastors of Bethel Church, Bill and Benny Johnson. Hopefully we'll get our screen up here. If not, I apologize to those sitting over here on this side. Uh, you won't be able to see these pictures very well. But these are Bill and Benny Johnson. Bill is an apostle, or a so-called apostle. Benny is a prophet at Bethel Church. And they sort of co-pastor the church. They go together in the leadership of this church and uh, have done quite a bit to further the cause. Uh, Bethel Church, for a number of years, was just um, a, a kind of a medium-sized Assembly of God church in Redding, California. It was founded back in the 1950s, and it just went along as kind of another uh, church in Redding, kind of preaching the Bible and doing their Assemblies of God type thing. In 1996, Bill Johnson came on staff as pastor, answering the call. His father actually had previously pastored the church, but Bill came on as pastor with the one stipulation that the message from the pulpit would always be about revival. Now, I don't have a real problem with that. I, I think churches need to be more balanced than that, but uh, you know, it, there are revivalists. I'm thankful for that. I pray that God will send a revival to America. I pray that every day. I'm certainly interested in revival. But revival needs to be understood in the context of what Bill Johnson means by revival. And that has a lot to do with um, how he was brought up and what he was exposed to. And what he means by revival is probably not the same thing that you and I would understand as revival. In 2005, uh, Bethel re withdrew its membership from the Assemblies of God and uh, kind of formed their own uh, network of churches that we'll talk about in a moment. This is a picture of Bethel Church. Um, and uh, for those of you who can see over on this side, uh, down at the bottom right-hand corner, that's not a rock concert, that's a church service. Uh, so I have, uh, I've only been to a, a Bethel service once, but I did have to go to find out what it was all about, and it's pretty wild. Uh, and that's okay, too. I don't mind things being a little bit wild either, but as long as they're scriptural and, um, and um, truly biblical. Well, <clears throat> in, um, uh, one of the ministries, one of the main ministries now of Bethel Church is the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministries, which meets in the, um, in the Reading Civic Auditorium, which is kind of a huge auditorium for our area, and they had to... Um, to rent this in order to hold their school. It has become so popular. People come from all over the world to Little Redding, California to attend Bethel's School of Supernatural Ministry. Uh, the picture down here on the bottom right-hand corner is uh, showing the, the, the first year class 
of Supernatural School of Ministry of 1,200 students just in their first year class. And so it gives you an idea of the, the size of this. I have traveled um, to the East Coast, tell people I'm from Redding, California, gotten the response, oh, well, that's where Bethel is. I've traveled to Israel and mentioned that I'm from Redding. And in Israel, I had people say, oh, well, that's where Bethel is. I have a cousin who lives in Toronto, Canada, and she said, oh, Reading, that's where Bethel School of Ministry is. It has really put our little town on the map worldwide. And they do fly in from all over the world to attend this uh, School of Supernatural Ministry. In 2018, uh, just the church alone reported that they had 11,233 people who called Bethel their home church. And then another arm of Bethel Church is Bethel Music, and you may have heard of Bethel Music. Uh, Bethel Music started as a ministry of Bethel Church in Reading and has become a worldwide uh, music publishing outfit. And uh, Bethel Music is showing up in churches, evangelical churches, good churches, not really knowing the background of Bethel Music and where this music is coming from. You know, music that really appeals to the younger folks and uh, some of the music is actually pretty good as far as the, the words are concerned. Others have subtly in it um, bad doctrine that you have to be aware of. So this, this, is, uh, this is Bethel Church, and this is kind of where it's all happening in Redding, California, although there are three other centers around Northern Calif or, uh, North America that I'll mention uh, in just a few moments. But the origins of the New Apostolic Reformation actually go back to C. Peter Wagner. C. Peter Wagner was, uh, was a missionary for many years, and then he became a professor of church growth at Fuller Theological Seminary, and many of you have heard of and know about C. Peter Wagner and his involvement with the Vineyard Movement, the Third Wave Movement, and, and this sort of thing. He is the founder of the International Coalition of Apostles, which relates now to what's going on with the New Apostolic Reformation. And it was he, C. Peter Wagner, who first used the phrase New Apostolic Reformation in 1996. It really comes to fruition about the year 2000. But uh, it was intended by Wagner to be a, an advance upon the third wave movement. C. Peter Wagner was quite involved with the third wave movement, but it just wasn't going as far as he wanted it to go. Here's a quote from Wagner. He said, quote, We are now living in the midst of one of the most epical changes in the structure of the church that has ever been recorded. I like to call it the second apostolic age. And that's coming from C. Peter Wagner's book, Apostles Today, Biblical Government for Biblical Power, published by Regal Books. There's an excellent book that's been published recently. In fact, there's another book I just became aware of today that I was looking at that looks really good. Um, but uh, one excellent book on the New Apostolic Refor Reformation is, um, uh, and I don't know if I have the, the author's names pronounced correctly, but Givet and Holly Pivak, Doug Givet and Holly Pivak, titled A New Apostolic Reformation, A Biblical Response to a Worldwide Movement. Yeah, I will. The, la the, the last name of the first author is G-E-I-V-E-T-T. G-E-I-V-E-T-T. Douglas Givet. And the, the co-author is Holly Pivek, P-I-V-E-C. P-I-V-E-C. Thank you for asking that question. Yeah. G-E-I-V-E-T-T. P-I-V-E-C, the title, A New Apostolic Reformation, question mark, a biblical response to a worldwide movement. And um, so it's, uh, it's available in Logos, and that's, I got it as an electronic book, which makes it easy to uh, search and so forth. I want to share a quote from Givet and Pivak. Um, they say this about the, the terms apostolic and Reformation, New Apostolic Reformation. They say it's apostolic because its leaders claim they're restoring the lost office of apostle to the church, an office endowed with astonishing authority, miraculous powers, 
and divine strategies for establishing God's kingdom on earth. It's a reformation because proponents say the movement will completely change the way church is done and its effects will be as great or even greater than the 16th century Protestant Reformation. So uh, this is uh, C. Peter Wagner in his new apostolic reformation, and it's coming to fruition through Bethel Church and other aligned churches that we'll talk about in a moment. Um, so there's that quote from uh, C. Peter Wagner. Now, <clears throat> um, Givet and Pivak also had this to say. Um, a controversial and highly publicized apostolic decree was made on June 23, 2008. This was a pivotal time in the development of the new apostolic reformation. Todd Bentley, whom many of you have uh, heard about, he's the guy covered in tattoos in this picture over here. Todd Bentley was formally commissioned as an evangelist to lead the Lakeland Revival in Florida. Under Wagner's leadership, Prominent apostles gathered for the ceremony, which was broadcast worldwide on God TV. The purpose of the ceremony was to decree, listen to this, the apostolic alignment of Bentley with three apostles, Cheon of Pasadena, California, Bill Johnson of Redding, California, and John Arnott of Toronto, Canada. Now, let the geography here sink in. You have Todd Bentley in Florida, you got Che An in Pasadena, Bill Johnson in Redding, and John Arnott of Toronto. Those are basically four corners of North America. And uh, this is not any accident that these are the, the focal areas, because from these four corners, of course, the plan is to inundate all of North America. But this is not just a North American phenomenon. In fact, my friend here was telling me about the devastating consequences in Europe of the New Apostolic Reformation, and we see it sweeping across, across Africa as well as I'm, and, and I don't know where else, but uh, it's very interesting. Anyway, uh, Givet and Pivak go on to say, by becoming apostolically aligned with these three apostles who represent an apostolic network called Revival Alliance, Bentley was agreeing to come under their authority. This is in line with New Apostolic Reformation teaching that all offices of the church, including the office of evangelist, must submit to apostles. During the ceremony, Wagner referred to On, Johnson, and Arnott as, and these are uh, C. Peter Wagner's terms, quote, apostolic pillars of today's church. So, uh, what we have then is an attempt to bring back both apostolic and prophetic authority as it was seen in the days of the apostles. And so it originates in our day with C. Peter Wagner and the New Apostolic Reformation, but it's really nothing new. Uh, this idea that we need to bring back the authority and the power of the apostles as seen in the book of Acts is something that has come up time and time again um, in the history of God's dealings with mankind. In fact, the problem of false apostles is well known in, uh, in the Old Testament as well. In fact, this morning, just before lunch, uh, we heard uh, our, our presenter talk about the prophet Micaiah, the false prophet, and kind of the funny story that uh, goes along with that. Jeremiah 28 has another kind of parallel story about the false prophet Hananiah. Uh, who confronted Jeremiah. Uh, so the problem of false prophets has been around for a long time, and I think that that's basically what we are looking at with the New Apostolic Reformation as an issue of false prophets. Well, in the history of the church, it arose again in the second century with Montanism. Montanus up in um, Anatolia saw that the power and authority of the apostles and the early prophets had gone away and he wanted to bring it back. Uh, of course, Montanism was, was condemned as heretical by the early church. Martin Luther in the, in the time of the Reformation had his problems with the Zwickau prophets who were trying to prophesy like the prophets in biblical times and it caused no end of consternation 
for Martin Luther because he thought that the Reformation needed to be founded just in the Word of God and in the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God. But these Vicar prophets wanted to add to that extra revelation that was coming from heaven. In the 1830s, we have the Irvingites. Then in the 1980s, the Kansas City prophets. In the 1990s, of course, the International House of Prayer and the Toronto Blessing. All these are simply precursors and, uh, and uh, repetitions of this idea of trying to bring back apostolic prophetic authority as it was seen <clears throat> in the days of the apostles. And this is precisely what the so-called new apostolic reformation is all about. So I would just really call it the old apostolic reformation or old something, but it's like so many new things. Um, so that's sort of the background uh, what are some of the defining characteristics of the new apostolic reformation? There are four of them that I'd like to mention this morning or this afternoon. Number one is restoring apostolic authority. And I want to talk to you about that, what that means, and how we can test or judge that. The second characteristic is restoring prophetic authority. And the new apostolic reformation makes a distinction between apostles and prophets. Um, all apostles are prophets, but not all prophets are apostles. So uh, they, are, they are overlapping areas. A third characteristic is restoring dominion authority, which I think in this co uh, conference is what I'd like to camp on, because this is where it ties in with eschatology. And uh, to me is one of the most troubling aspects of the New Apostolic Reformation is their, uh, their post-millennialism and their desire to bring in the kingdom of God through the activities of the church. It's a total misreading of scripture, but it causes them to be uh, vehemently non-dispensational. And really, you know, this is a pre-trib uh, rapture study group. Uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the strength with which they deny the teaching of the, um, of the rapture of the church is quite notable. So when we think about um, this matter of um, uh, dominion theology, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about this book that was published by Bill Johnson and Lance Wallnau called Invading Babylon, and the subtitle is The Seven Mountain Mandate. The Seven Mountain Mandate is what really form formulates the post-millennial dominion theology of the New Apostolic Reformation. If you, if you encounter New Apostolic Reformation very much, you'll hear a lot about the Seven Mountain Mandate. This book, by the way, and the Seven Mountain Mandate is post-millennial. It is replacement theology, and quite frankly, as Americans, I'll have to say, it is unconstitutional in the way it approaches their view of um, the church and the state. Here's a quote from the introduction to the book, and this, uh, this part was not written by Bill, it's written about Bill Johnson, but uh, uh, Lance Wall now writes, quote, Bill Johnson, senior leader of Bethel Church in Redding, California, opens this book with a foundational teaching on dominion theology. I remember the first time I, I heard about dominion theology, I think it was back in the 1970s, it was an article that Tommy wrote that appeared in uh, Bibsack and on neo-post-millennialism, and, uh, and uh, that was a great article. But it's interesting that the previous emergence of neo-post-millennialism came from Calvinists. Now it's coming out of the Pentecostal side of things, but the, it's wrong for the same reasons. Anyway, um, he, he goes on to say, in simple terms, dominion theology is the idea that Christian believers are called to not only preach the gospel and win converts to Christ, but also what? To establish the kingdom of God on the earth. So the New Apostolic Reformation believes that the church's commission is to establish the kingdom of God on earth. It is, in fact, post-millennialism. Bill encourages all believers to learn how to walk in the full authority of the gospel. Now, the full authority of the gospel means to walk with the full authority that Jesus Christ had when he was on earth. So he goes on to say, the full authority of the gospel so that they can heal the sick, raise the dead, 
and see people touched and transformed by the power of God. How does the church invade Babylon? By confidently infiltrating every area of life with the kingdom of God. And every area of life is defined by these seven mountains that I'll mention a moment ago, in just a moment. But while, I, while I'm saying that, let me just pause and say that uh, while Bethel Church is seeking to um, uh, heal the sick, they have not been able to heal um, Redding, California, of the COVID-19 virus. Uh, Bethel Church, in fact, has gone into shutdown mode <coughs> and is doing all their, their um, services online. Uh, Invading Babylon book goes on to say, Lance Walnow says, the seven mountain revelation helps us strategically identify different aspects of society so that cultural transformation can become a manageable task. All of us are called to at least one of these seven mountains, and he lists them here, religion, arts, media, business, government, family, and education. As we begin taking land for our king, we will undoubtedly face great resistance. So again, what you see here is the replacement theology. Israel was given a land, a promised land. They were supposed to take it for God, claim it for God, and use it for God's purposes to establish the kingdom. And so the New Apostolic Reformation, I mean, clearly states that their, their intention here is to claim land real estate for God. Uh, and then uh, Walnut goes on to say, the third chapter of this book offers a profound teaching about taking spiritual ground, and notice this, by occupying, occupying the spiritual gates of our cities. Gates represent the spiritual powers that rule over geographical areas. So hopefully you can see there the, uh, the post-millennialism and the replacement theology that is, that is uh, really abundantly clear from their own writings. So once again, these are the seven mountains that they say the church is to occupy. Now, let me say this. I have no problem with Christians exerting influence over any or all of these areas. We should be salt and light in the world. And we should have an influence. We should have an impact on the world around us. But that's one thing. It's another thing to say that our mission or our commission from the Lord is to take control of these areas. Education, religion, family, business. Look at number five, government and military. Arts and entertainment and media. Um, great if we can influence these, and I'm all for it, but that's just not the great commission. And uh, it, in fact, can become quite a sidetrack from the great commission if we begin to think that that is our commission from the Lord. The fourth characteristic, and I'll have more to say about dominion theology as we go on, but I'm just introducing it at this point, but the fourth characteristic is signs and wonders, of course. So signs and wonders is probably what most people talk about when they talk about Bethel Church. And there have been some really uh, uh, <laughs> uh, remarkable excesses in this area. Well, let me say, first of all, that um, I believe that God is a miracle-working God. Um, the fact, actually, that I'm standing here right now is something of a miracle, if you had known what happened to me a couple of years ago. The fact that Tommy Ice is here this morning, I think, is a miracle from God. Tommy's gone through his own difficult times, challenging times uh, physically, and many people here know that the powerful hand of God has been at work in their life. No doubt about it. But when we come to um, Bethel Church, we're talking about something entirely different. The excesses observed in the area of signs and wonders at Bethel are at least troubling and distracting, and at worst, charlatanism and fraud. So what are some of the things that, that have been reported there? Well, number one, the, the so-called glory cloud they talk about. Uh, this glory cloud is claimed to appear in some of the church services, and they liken it to the Shekinah glory in the Old Testament. Um, and it is a phenomenon that has been taped. You can go on to Google, and you can Google glory cloud, Bethel Church. You can watch YouTube videos of it. Uh, 
supposedly out of nowhere in the middle of a church, either coming down from the rafters or coming up from the floor, is this, this luminous cloud that appears. It has been speculated by some that this is gold dust that's been placed into the ventilation systems. That's the most reasonable explanation that I have heard of it. Um, I, I don't know what it is. Um, but, but this is one of the things, and they just, they just love it, and I don't know how many times it's appeared, probably only a handful of times, and I uh, haven't heard too much of it in the last year or two, but um, the glory cloud is, is one thing, and they, they talk about God being present in them because they can see that just as the Shekinah glory was present in the Temple of Solomon. Another thing that is reported at times are angel feathers drifting down from the rafters and people claim to have these feathers. Um, so that's another example. Some people have claimed to find diamonds and gems in, among the, the, the seating in Bethel Church. Now, I, I asked a, uh, a local Reading jeweler about this, and he's never seen any of these diamonds or gems that came from Bethel Church. I've never met anybody who had a first-hand or even a second-hand account of it, but you get these stories all the time, and you hear these things about diamonds and gems showing up. <clears throat> but probably one of, the, one of the most odd and peculiar things is what's called grave soaking. Sometimes it's mispronounced as grave sucking. You hear that, but the term they use is grave soaking, and really what they prefer to call it is picking up a fallen mantle. And I want to ta talk a little bit about this. Um, the idea here is that, you know, when, when Elijah went on to heaven, he cast his mantle down, and he told Elisha that if Elisha saw him being taken up, that he would be able to uh, receive his mantle. So when Elisha took up the mantle of Elijah, he was able with that mantle to cause the Jordan River to split, and he could go on, he could go on in the power of Elijah. So what grave soaking is all about is picking up the fallen mantle of past great evangelists by going to their graves, lying on the graves, and soaking up their mantle from them. And uh, uh, I want to... Uh, try to give a little bit of a discussion about, a description of this, but first of all, let me say this, that Bill Johnson was asked by Michael Brown in an interview in 2019 about grave soaking, and uh, it had become kind of a controversial thing and something that, that Bethel Church had been criticized about a lot. And so what he did was he gave this, this kind of reply. Uh, Bill Johnson at that time, 2019, said, we don't talk to the dead, we don't seek imprintation from the dead. I have gone to the grave of Charles Finney and prayed, quote, God, do through us what you did through him. It's a point of reminder, and watch the last sentence here, but not to receive from them. Now, that's what he said in 2019, but let's back up a couple of years. And um, in 2012, Bill Johnson's book, The Physics of Heaven, he really explains the background to this grave soaking phenomenon. And in chapter four, which is titled Recovering Our Spiritual Inheritance, Bill Johnson says, where do we start? We can begin by recovering secrets, mysteries, notice the next word, mantles, and realms of God that have been abandoned and ignored for decades, some of them for centuries. We've been given an inheritance of hundreds of years of mystics, of revivalists, of those who broke into realms of the Spirit to leave something as an inheritance, and it needs to matter to someone. He goes on to say, there are anointings, notice once again the word mantles, revelations and mysteries that have, been lain, that have lain unclaimed literally where they were left because the generation that walked in them never passed them on. I believe, says Johnson, it's possible for us to recover realms of anointing, realms of insight, realms of God that have been untended for decades simply by choosing to reclaim them and perpetuate them for the future. 
So while he told Michael Brown that we were not going there to receive something from these graves, what he actually said was, these mantles have been laid down, they've been left unclaimed, and we need to go claim them. And if that's not receiving them, I don't know what is. I think, in fact, what happened was he had been so severely criticized that he kind of backpedaled in his interview with Michael Brown. Well, in case you're wondering, those of you that can see the picture, and again, my apologies for you over here, here's, Be here's Benny Johnson on one of their trips to England where she, she is shown uh, lying on the grave of C.S. Lewis, trying to soak up his mantle. Here's another picture of Benny hugging the uh, tombstone of Charles Finney to uh, soak up or to receive the mantle that was laid down. Numbers of Bethel students have made special trips to these uh, graveyards simply to soak up the mantles of, of great past um, evangelists. So um, signs and wonders uh, is, is quite something. And maybe one of the most egregious of the signs and wonders is this last one that I'll mention before I go on to an evaluation of the New Apostolic Reformation, but that is prayer for an individual's resurrection from the dead. Uh, from the website of Bethel Church, uh, I'll read this following announcement. It says, a group of students from Bethel's School of Supernatural Ministry is willing to go to the funeral home, morgue, or family's home where the deceased is being kept. The team claims, listen to this, the team claims to have seen at least 12 resurrections of the dead through its prayers. Now, let me tell you something. I've lived in Reading for many years, and I am well-connected uh, throughout Reading with the Christian community and with many non-Christian community. I have never heard of a resurrection in Reading, but they claim there have been 12 of them. I think that if there had been even one actual resurrection from the dead, it would have been front-page news. And I think that uh, it would have been well known. If there were 12 of them, I don't know how I could have avoided all these years meeting anybody that knew about these resurrections from the dead. And yet this is the claim on their website. But most heartbreaking of all is an event that occurred just about one year ago today. Uh, December 14th, 2019, a talented young couple, Andrew and Callie Heilingenthal lost their two-year-old child, Olive. The girl simply stopped breathing early December 14, 2019, and when she arrived at the hospital, she was declared dead, and her body was taken to the morgue. The young grieving couple, members of Bethel Church in Reading, and by the way, talented musicians that are uh, frequently on the platform at Bethel, uh, the young grieving couple believed that God might perform a miracle and restore Olive's life. The church supported them in this hope and organized a series of highly public prayer events seeking to raise the little girl back to life. And by highly publicized, uh, that's true, it was all over the TV news, all over the newspapers, all of Reading was, uh, had their attention on this effort to raise this girl. And I'll tell you, my heart really goes out to this, uh, this poor couple that had been duped and deceived by Bethel Church because they had their hopes built up only to be dashed by what could only have been uh, uh, an outcome of this. The church supported them in this hope, organized a series of uh, public prayer events. Bill Johnson said in the sermon, December 20th, we have done this in accordance with the Bible. But of course, as you might surmise, the girl was not raised to the dead, and it was just kind of left as this kind of haunting emptiness that echoed around the Reading area. Uh, you would think that something like that would have had a negative impact on Bethel Church, but it didn't. People continue to flock there. Uh, they love Bill Johnson. They love the music. Uh, they love uh, all the... Uh, signs and wonders and the phenomena that are going on. So uh, there you have that. Well, that's kind of a background to what Bethel Church and the New Apostolic Reformation uh, are. 
I want to go on to talk about a biblical evaluation of this movement. I have this in two parts, because this is actually about a two-hour um, presentation, and I usually take about an hour for the first part, an hour for the second part, but I've, I've, I've shortened it somewhat. Are we doing time waste? We're we doing good. Um, okay, so the three doctrinal aberrations that we mentioned, three of the uh, characteristics, but three doctrinal aberrations I want to confront and deal with scripturally are, number one, the restoration of the apostolic office, Number two, the restoration of the prophetic office. And number three, their dominion theology. And as I was preparing this, uh, this message, I happened to be reading in Revelation for my, my personal devotions. And as I was going through chapters two and three in the letters to the seven churches of Asia, I was, I was struck by something. I thought, now this is interesting. This sounds just like the New Apostolic Reformation because what Christ is warning the churches about are these issues. False apostles, false prophets, and the third I will call um, false Jews. Uh, take a look at this. False apostles, Revelation 2, verse 2, to the church at Ephesus, Jesus said, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and you put to test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. So at the end of the first century, when the apostle John was the last of the 12 that were alive, there were other men who were calling themselves apostles, and they were false apostles. But the church at Ephesus was commended because they had put those men to the test and I'll talk about testing apostles in just a moment, but um, that's one, one area. The second, restoring the prophetic office. Notice what Christ wrote to the church at Thyatira. He says, I have this against you, church at Thyatira, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself what? A prophetess. And she teaches and leads my servants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. So there was, um, at, again, at the end of the first century when the prophetic gift was passing off the scene, there was this Jezebel, whoever she was, calling herself or himself a prophet or prophet test. It was false prophecy. And the church at Thyatira was condemned for tolerating that. Now this third one is, uh, I'm gonna have to ask you to kind of bear with me here a little bit. I wanna give a, a little different view than you might be accustomed to thinking about here. And I'm not convinced I'm right about this, but I kinda like this, this idea here of what was going on. To the church at Philadelphia, Revelation 3, 9, Christ wrote, behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not but lie, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I've loved you. Now, most, most commentators talk about the synagogue of Satan as a, a Jewish synagogue that hated the Christians. Um, but notice what it says. It says they say they are Jews and are not. So that causes me to wonder if what was going on here wasn't maybe something like we see in some messianic congregations today, some messianic congregations that are populated by mostly Gentiles who are calling themselves Jews. And they're taking on the law and saying we're the true Jewish people. It's a form of replacement theology. Could it be that in the, at the end of the first century, after the destruction of the temple, there were Christians now who were calling themselves the true Israel of God, and they had formed a congregation and said, we're the Jews, we're the inheritors of God's promises. That would be a kind of replacement theology. Okay, I'm not 100% convinced that that's correct about this interpretation here, but I hold it out as a possibility, and if it is true, then we would be also facing replacement theology and a kind of dominion theology at the end of the first century. So that's just, uh, just for you to think about. But let's take these in turn, uh, restoration of the apostolic authority, then, ref then the prophetic authority, and then lastly, dominion, dominion theology. 
Um, as for the apostolic office, um, we need to understand that the term apostle, even in the New Testament, is used in two ways. Most of the time in the New Testament is used in a technical sense, referring to the office of apostle and restricted to the 12. Um, for instance, in Matthew 10, we come across this. Now, the names of the 12 apostles are these, and he names them. Acts chapter 5, we have this going on. The Sanhedrin is telling Peter and the other apostles, we gave you strict orders not to continue in the teaching. In this name, you fill Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But then it says what? But Peter and the apostles answered. So the apostles were this limited group. Romans 1.1, 1, 1, of course, Paul includes himself among the apostles. And he says, Paul, a bond servant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Now, there are a few places in the New Testament where the term apostolos is used in the non-technical sense, referring to a gift or to a ministry restriction, um, or ministry description. And uh, this is not the prominent use, but that does occur a couple of times. For instance, in Philippians 2.25, Paul says, I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your, New American Standard says, messenger, but it's the same word, apostolos. Now, we wouldn't say that Epaphroditus was an apostle in the technical sense of that term, but he was a messenger, he was sent out, which is the basic idea behind the word apostolos, one sent. We might say that he was an emissary of the church, and so sometimes the word apostolos is used that way. Paul uses it this way again in 2 Corinthians 8, 23, where he says, as for Titus, he's my partner and fellow worker. As for our brethren, they are, and here our New American Standard translates it's messengers, and against the word apostolos, they are emissaries, messengers, those sent from the churches to the glory of Christ. So you can have either a technical or a non-technical use of the term. Um, but, uh, and you know, in some of the churches, especially I found in some of the African churches, it's become quite common for um, uh, ministers of churches to refer to themselves as apostle. And I think they're using that in a non-technical sense. They don't think of themselves as one of the 12 apostles. But see, Peter Wagner's idea was to bring back the office of apostle as it was known in the New Testament times, referring not to just a, a general sense of a, a minister of the gospel, but to the 12 apostles. See, Peter Wagner's vision is based on what he calls the five-fold ministry based on Ephesians 4.11, which says, and he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors, and some as teachers. Peter Wagner thought that the, the third wave movement was lacking in power for this very reason that it did not include the full five-fold ministry described here in Ephesians 4.11. So he raised that if we could bring back all five of these offices to the church, then the church would be as powerful and forceful as it was in the book of Acts. So this is the, the, the basis of his, his bringing back the, the office of apostle. So he says these apostles are only different from the New Testament apostles in that today they don't write scripture. In every other respect, they're like the apostles of the New Testament. Now, the apostles of today's New Apostolic Reformation may not write scripture, but they do a lot of writing. Uh, I went on Amazon to search for books by Bill Johnson, and here you have a list of the books that you can find on Amazon. There's like 26 of them. And I'll tell you this, the students that go to Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry spend their time studying these books, not Scripture. So while they don't claim to write Scripture, I would say that uh, they do a lot of writing, and their writings are held to be as authoritative as Scripture. In fact, I'll tell you something kind of interesting. Over on the other side of Reading from Bethel Church is Little Shasta Bible College. 
We've actually had students from Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry come and take classes with us, and I asked them why. And they said, well, we went to the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry to learn how to minister the Word of God, and we're not taught the Bible. And they've actually told me this, that when I asked about learning the Bible, they told me, why don't you go over to Shasta Bible College and you can learn the Bible there? So there is this effort to reinstate apostolic authority. They don't claim to author scripture, but they write lots of books and they tend to study these books instead of scripture. And I think practically speaking, uh, you might as well say that they're writing scripture. But they do, they do officially make the distinction between their books and scripture, to be fair to them. Well, apostles need to be tested. That is, those who claim to be apostles. Now, I'll be totally honest with you. I take a cessationist viewpoint. Not everybody here probably does take the cessationist viewpoint. But I think that the apostles and the prophets just passed off the scene somewhere towards the end of the first century. So it's an easy argument for me. But let's assume for the sake of the argument that God is still giving gifts like those. Um, if that's the case then anybody who claims to be an apostle should be tested. As we saw, the church at Ephesus was commended because they put those claimants to the apostolic office to the test. 2 Corinthians 11:13 says, such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as the apostles of Christ. So even earlier in the first century, the apostle Paul had a problem with false apostles coming to the church at Corinth. Not only that, but uh, there are other places in the scripture where there were problems with false, uh, false apostles and false prophets. So how do you test an apostle? Well, again, I wanna, I wanna appeal to um, Givet and Pivak's book they list five characteristics of New Testament apostles that could serve as a five-fold test of apostleship. And number one characteristic is that a true apostle must literally have seen the resurrected Lord, according to 1 Corinthians 9.1. So you could not be an apostle without having seen the resurrected Lord. Well, of course, the objection might be, well, what about the apostle Paul himself? He wasn't alive to see the resurrected Lord. But he did see the resurrected Lord on the road to Damascus, didn't he? Of course, now the new apostolic reformation apostles might say, well, we've also seen the resurrected Lord in a vision. So they would say we would have the same ability as Paul to claim to be an apostle. But the difference is simply this, that Paul's vision, uh, first of all, was an exception to the other apostles, but his experience was a verifiable experience. It was witnessed by those who were with him. They all saw the light. They heard the noise. Uh, and it was confirmed by the Damascus Christians who witnessed his healing from blindness. And that would differentiate the kind of experience that Paul had with the kind of experiences that we see today by, by those claimants to the apostleship. A second characteristic of a New Testament apostle is they must have received a specific commission by Christ in the fashion of those first commissioned during the apostolic age. And so we could uh, appeal to Matthew 10, Luke 6, Acts 1, and so forth. And of course, when Paul was uh, stricken from his horse on the road to Damascus, he did receive a very specific commission from the Lord. Number three, they must perform miracles that attest to their authority as apostles of Christ. And um, of course, once again, those in the New Apostolic Reformation might come back and say, hey, this is our forte, man. This is what we're all about, are the signs and the wonders and the miracles. But once again, there is a difference between the miracles and the signs and wonders that we see performed by the New Testament apostles versus those that we see in the New Apostolic Reformation. The miracles performed by the New Testament apostles were spectacular, they were verifiable, and they were without failure. Uh, those that are claimed by the New Apostolic Reformation are none of those things. Number four, any teachings or practices that apostles 
promote must be supported in scripture. So um, we had mentioned earlier today about the Bereans. So in Acts 17, 11, the Bereans were more commendable than the Philippians because they searched the scripture daily to see whether what Paul was teaching was true. A true apostle will have his teachings submitted to the searchlight of scripture. What they teach must be supported in scripture. And there are serious scriptural problems with the teachings coming out of Bethel Church, and we'll get to those in a moment. I think I'm watching my time. I'm going to be like, uh, who was that always took up his time? I, I got started late anyway. Okay, um, so uh, this, these are some of the problems that we have. The fifth characteristic is that they must exhibit an exemplary quality of ministry and lives of the highest level of virtue and integrity. That must be true of an apostle. Uh, Givet and Pivak say this, Genu- I, li- I really like this quote, genuine apostles of Christ will be willing to endure great suffering in fulfillment of their commission, as did the apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 1, 2 Corinthians 11. They will not use methods that are deceitful or that tamper with scripture. They will be motivated by sincerity and marked by the character traits of self-sacrifice and humility. So, um, uh, I'll just leave it at that. Those are five tests that could be applied to anybody claiming to be an apostle. I'll tell you that the New Apostolic Reformation apostles are weighed in the balances and found wanting in all five of these areas. Now, when it comes to the prophets, um, the reassertion of the prophetic office, we should ask the question, are New Testament prophets different from Old Testament prophets? And that question needs to be raised because most of the time those who are promoting the gift of a prophet for today have to insist that that New Testament prophecy is different from Old Testament prophecy. Because in the Old Testament, the prophets had to be 100% accurate in their prophecies, in their predictions, or else they were false false, uh, prophets. Now, it's interesting to me that this argument that New Testament prophets are different from Old Testament prophets actually has been promoted um, by some from the Calvinist uh, standpoint. And so, um, Wayne Grudem, in his systematic theology and in a book that he has written on the gift of prophecy, actually develops this whole argument and he bases it, he bases his whole argument on, I think, a flawed exegesis of uh, the prophecy of Agabus concerning Paul's deliverance to the Romans. And uh, we won't have time to go into all of that, but um, John Piper is very taken with, um, uh, with Grudem's argument. And so John Piper also has been promoting this idea, uh, and both Grudem and Piper are very much in favor with the the prophetic uh, uh, gift being given today. Well, uh, I would say that New Testament prophecy is not different from Old Testament prophecy. There were prophets in the New Testament, and they were simply a continuation of the line of prophets that began in the Old Testament. It wasn't like some new phenomenon came along that had never been experienced before. When the New Testament... Christians of the first century had prophets. They knew what prophets were from the Old Testament. The prophetic office was something that they knew about. And they also knew how to put prophets to the test. So um, in Revelation 2.20, again, we have this Jezebel who was a a false prophetess. 1 John 1, 4, or 4, 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but do what? Test the spirits. So if we assume for the sake of the argument that there might be prophets today, if there are prophets today, they must be tested. Test the spirits to see whether they're from God. Why? Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Again, 1 Corinthians 12, 10, to another is given the effecting of miracles, To another, notice prophecy, and what's next? To another, the distinguishing of spirits. 
the distinguishing of spirits in this verse are those, that distinguishing of the spirit of prophecy was just mentioned. So the ability to put them to the test by distinguishing, by discerning, by judging. 1 Corinthians 14, 29, let two or three prophets speak and let the others, what? Pass judgment. So when there is prophecy ongoing, it needs to be put under a microscope and observed and evaluated and judged. 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 and 21 says, don't despise prophetic utterances, but what? Examine everything carefully. So if there is prophecy, we must judge it. Don't be quickly shaken or sh shaken from your composure or be disturbed by a, a spirit or message or a letter, what? As if from us. So there were people who were apparently sending letters in the name of the Apostle Paul, claiming to have his prophetic authority. So it's from the Old Testament we get the tests of the prophets. And there are two tests that we read about in the book of Deuteronomy. The first is the test of fulfillment. Deuteronomy 18, 20 to 22 says, but the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name or speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. So the, 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 the penalty for false prophet under the Old Testament dispensation was death, death by stoning. You may say in your heart, how will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. So Bethel Church's main prophet is a man by the name of Chris Volaton. And I'll just mention two or three prophecies that he made recently. First, he made a very, very public uh, prophecy that was publicized on their website and so forth, saying that uh, President Trump would not be... Um, uh, what was it, what they call, call it before uh, Congress, uh, impeached, okay? Well, he was impeached. Now, the Senate didn't uphold it, but he was impeached. So he had to backpedal from that. But then he went on to say, and President Trump will win re-election. Now, I guess that's still hanging in the balances, but we'll wait to see what happens with that one. So uh, Chris Volaton has made a number of prophecies. Some of them come true, some of them don't come true. Most of them that come true are kind of very broad, vague, general types of prophecies. Uh, Givet and Pivak actually tell about a time when, when Holly Pivak came to Reading, went to the, the Bethel Church uh, Sunday school class that was teaching how to prophesy. And she has some rather humorous stories to tell about people that attempted to prophesy in that class uh, and I won't take the time to read those to you, but um, it, it's quite something. Uh, this is just, uh, I don't know, it, it, it just, uh, you read about these things and you just come away thinking this is sheer charlatanism. The second test from the Old Testament is the, the test of doctrine. So notice this in, in Deuteronomy 13, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives a sign or a wonder, and the sign or a wonder comes true, now notice, this one passes the test of fulfillment. But there's a second test. And it comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods whom you have not known. Let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So here you have somebody claiming to be a prophet whose prophecy comes true, but he fails the second test, the test of doctrine. He says, let us go after other gods. What he teaches you is not in conformity with the revealed word of God. That prophet is a false prophet, and he should be taken out and stoned. So what about the teaching of the prophets at Bethel Church? Well, uh, I want to just bring up one or two of the items here taught by Bill Johnson that are rather serious, I think. And one is the teaching of what's known as the kenotic view of Christ, the kenosis theory coming out of Philippians chapter 2. And it's the idea that, has, that, that when Christ came to earth, 
he laid his deity aside and that the life he lived on earth was done simply as a man who was fully indwelt and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Here's the quote from Bill Johnson's book, When Heaven Invades Earth. He says, on pages 87 and 8, Jesus laid his divinity aside, see Philippians 2, 5 through 7, as he sought to fulfill the assignment given to him by the Father. Now, the New Apostolic Reformation needs this doctrine desperately because their teaching is that Christians should be able to do anything that Jesus did. If Jesus laid his divinity aside and performed his miracles merely by the fact that he was filled with the Holy Spirit, then you or I could be filled with the Spirit and do the same things he did, healing the sick, raising the dead, and so forth. So they need this kenosis theory. Um, but Christ's miracles were, in fact, performed in order to prove that he had not laid his divinity aside. We're told in the Bible that his miracles were done to prove his deity. For instance, in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, we read, therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written why? So that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. So his miracles proved his deity. And, and one other verse I really like here in this connection, in Luke 8, 39, after healing the leper, he said, return to your house and describe what great things God has done for you. And then Luke follows with this comment and says, so he went away proclaiming through the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. So again, it was the miracle that proved that Jesus was, in fact, God. So um, this whole doctrine of the, the kenosis theory of Jesus laying aside his divinity is a, is a ridiculous position, uh, not to mention the fact that it's heretical. But uh, it's a self-defeating argument. You know, if Jesus could give up his divine attributes, then God can change. But one of God's attributes is that he's immutable. So if he can change, then he's not immutable. If he's not immutable, he's not God. And so it's a self-defeating argument. But the position is maintained by Bethel Church. Here's the actual verse that the canonic view comes from. It says, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. And it's the self-emptying that they take to mean emptying of his deity. But emptied himself doesn't mean that he lost anything. In fact, the verse itself starts out by saying he existed in the form of God. And if he was fully God in eternity, he could not be un-God in time. So this, this emptying of himself was a, a pouring of himself into his mission completely and fully. Um, so I have some other ideas on what that might mean, but let me just say that it does not mean that he gave up his deity. A second doctrinal error that's taught by Bethel Church is, um, is the idea of, of I guess Christian perfectionism, which might come out of Wesleyanism or something like that, but the idea that, that the Christian can attain such a state of, of the fullness of the Holy Spirit that he gets beyond uh, temptation to sin. And I'll just, uh, I probably should not read all of this, but let me, let me read a little bit of it. He says, you know that David, this is from Bill Johnson's book, The Power That Changes the World, you know that David, my father, this is a quoting here from 1 Kings 5, David, my father, was unable to build a house in the name of the Lord. This is Solomon speaking. Because of the wars which surround him until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord, my God, has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor misfortune. Okay, that's the text from Scripture. Now watch what Bill Johnson does with this. This is an example of Johnsonian hermeneutics, I guess we can call it. The word adversary is the word satan, okay? Satan, which means an adversary. But he says the word for adversary here is Satan, 
And then he, he goes on to, I'm not going to read all this because I'm running out of time, but let me just say that he takes that as meaning that Solomon entirely got rid of Satan so that Solomon was no longer influenced by Satan. And therefore, it's possible for any of us to attain that same position. So this is what is held out. And again, it, it builds right into this canonic view. If it was possible for Christ, it's possible for us. Uh, contrary to that Christian perfectionism idea, of course, are the scriptures which tell us if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. And of course, Proverbs 20, verse 9, who can say, I've cleansed my heart, I'm pure from sin. So this uh, Christian perfectionism is taught in the New Apostolic Reformation and is part of the doctrinal errors that we encounter there. Now, I just want to finish up by referencing the Dominion theology once again. We talked about these seven areas that uh, the New Apostolic Reformation believes that Christians need to take over and control, including government and religion. Um, I read this uh, passage earlier from Invading Babylon where it talks about the Bill Johnson developing dominion theology. Here's a quote from the Bethel Church Statement of Faith. This can be found on their website today, I think, if you want. I just pulled this off there about two days ago. They say, we believe in the ever-increasing government of God and in the blessed hope. I believe in the blessed hope. You're at the pre-trib conference, you believe in the blessed hope, but watch what they, how they define the blessed hope, which is the glorious, visible return of the Lord Jesus Christ to rule and reign with his overcoming bride, the church. So you have to understand the dominion theology behind that statement. The church has already started bringing in the kingdom of God. That's why it's referred to as an ever-increasing government of God. And it will be culminated with the second coming of Christ, his glorious visible return to the earth to culminate that process. So it is a... Um, a post-millennial dominion theology. Um, let me just take you through the, the history of dominion theology very quickly. But the earliest Christians made no efforts to invade or conquer society or government. They understood their calling as a calling to preach the gospel to the unsaved and to bring them to maturity in Christ. But they had no interest in overcoming the Roman Empire or occupying the throne of Rome or anything like that. That all changed in the fourth century uh, when Constantine legalized Christianity and from then on both the Roman Catholic Church and the Byzantine Church saw themselves as earthly governments bringing in the kingdom. Augustine in his City of God explained how the church would bring in the kingdom of God so both Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy understood the church as a vehicle for bringing in the kingdom of God. In the Protestant Reformation, they began to break away from that concept, but they didn't succeed entirely. And of course, most of you are aware that Calvin in Geneva sought to wed church and state and institute a kingdom of God on the earth, and that was one of the biggest problems that Calvin had, in my opinion. In the 1980s, there was a new form of post-millennialism known as Dominion Theology, also going by the names Christian Reconstructionism and Theonomy coming from the Calvinist side of things. Uh, now we're seeing Dominion Theology coming from more of the Pentecostal and third wave movement side of things. So the most recent form is the New Apostolic Reformation envisioned by men like C. Peter Wagner, Bill Johnson, and others. Just recently, in April of 2017, an interesting thing happened in Reading from Bethel Church. Uh, the police department, like police departments in many cities, was underfunded and having problems. So Bethel offered to donate $500,000 to the city of Reading to assist in funding the salaries for police officers. It's a nice gesture. And I would applaud them for it, however, there was question about their motivation. 
Uh, and, and I'm quoting here from a, uh, this is quoted from a, um, uh, an article in the Record Searchlight, which is our, our uh, local newspaper. Some in the community thought the church was trying to pay off the city for future building permits. An assertion Pastor Chris Vallotton, whom I mentioned before, the chief uh, prophet at Bethel, whom Chris Vallotton refuted at a city council meeting. The city ultimately voted to receive the donation. No uh, surprise there. Uh, seven months after receiving the donation, Reading City Council unanimously approved a $96 million new Bethel campus despite dozens of formally submitted citizen concerns. The city council person, who is a member of Bethel, recused herself from the voting. So what's going on here is the church sees an opportunity to move in and control city government through the use of their funds, and that's perfectly legitimate giving their dominion theology. Well, we all understand that, that the church has a certain relationship to civil government. Some of us are struggling with that these days in terms of submission to human government. But uh, 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4, certainly teaches that we should pray for them, carry on the work of the gospel. Um, Romans 13 tells us to submit, as does Second Peter or 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, but there's nothing in here about the church invading or controlling or taking over human government. Uh, quite the contrary, Jesus really spoke of these two spheres as separate spheres, the sphere of the church, the sphere of the state. When asked, shall we give the uh, uh, tribute to uh, Rome? He said, well, you give to God the things that are God's and to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And uh, these two uh, exist in two separate realms. So Bethel Church and the New Apostolic Reformation. This is really, we've talked about its origins with C. Peter Wagner, its, uh, its strategic uh, approach to uh, being these four corners of the North American continent, uh, the problems with bringing in apostles and then prophets and then their involvement in dominion theology. So what is it, you know? We find false apostles, I think no question, in Bethel Church. We find false prophets. Uh, there is a false eschatology. There's a canonic view of Christ that makes up their teaching. Uh, they mention the possibility of perfection in this life for the believer. And uh, I would say that there is certainly heretical teaching in the New Apostolic Reformation. There are many people involved in Bethel Church who are dupes. They're taken in with what they see I think there are genuine, sincere lovers of Christ that have been gotten caught up. But the leaders are clearly offering a heretical view of Christ and a, an erroneous view of the church and the church's mission and relation to human government. And um, I have maybe time for a couple of questions. We do have a break after this, so I don't know what you want to do, Tommy. But, uh, uh, yeah, since you got started late, we'll extend your time by five minutes. <laughs> Yes. Hey, I don't really have a question. I just wanted to thank you so much for doing this. Um, my two brothers are heavily involved with Bethel, and it's just been so destructive to our family and our relationships. And it's something that can happen if the Vineyard Church was kind of the quote unquote gateway drug to Bethel. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> My brothers uh, both have two degrees from what's formerly known as Philadelphia Biblical University, and oh. my sister-in-law went to the Institute of Jewish Studies at Philadelphia Biblical University, so this can, in fact, happen to people that come from sound biblical backgrounds. So I hate talking in front of that's, people, so... That's tragic, and it's sad. It is. My it is. Out. But thank you so much for bringing it to people's attention, and it's really easy to laugh at what they believe, but some of these people really do love the Lord, yeah. and they believe it with all their heart, like these false teachings. It's just heartbreaking to watch. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Andy? Um, my question is about the um, conservative political commentator, Charlie Kirk. Um, a lot of churches are sort of, particularly in this election cycle that we just emerged from, 
kind of opening the door to him, letting him come into the pulpit. And I've heard him on a few interviews, you know, use Seventh Mountain Mandate type language. Oh, yeah. So I'm curious if you know anything about Charlie Clerk, Kirk and his uh, involvement with all of this stuff. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I hate to say this, but I don't know anything about Charlie Kirk. But, you know, the Seven Mountains Mandate, as I said, um, you know, these are seven areas that's fine if we have influence over those areas. And we should be influencing our world around us for the cause of Christ. But uh, it's just not the church's commission to take over those areas. And, and I think like, probably many of us here struggle with how political do we become? And there are some who say that we shouldn't become involved in politics. Others are very involved in politics. Um, I like to become involved in politics. I, I, you know, I'm a very conservative political guy. And I, it's just my, my orientation. But I have to caution myself at times. It's so easy for me to get so sidetracked into politics that I begin to ignore what Christ has really called me to, and that's reaching the lost for Christ. But uh, in, in, in dominion theology, these things just become so totally enmeshed and, and merged together that they feel their calling now is to Christianize the nations and to take control of government. Yeah, isn't Paula White uh, yeah. probably considered Trump's uh, spiritual chief advisor. spiritual advisor? She's heard. into a lot of this stuff yeah. as well, and and it, it's it's a been around for years, broader in the uh, Pentecostal movement, yeah. you know. So it, it's just that that's their particular iteration.